Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for coming tonight. My name is Rebecca Blatt. I'm an assistant dean here at the Cronkite School. Um, and it's my honor to welcome Mark Trahan here from uh, DC. He came in late yesterday. Um, and it's such a privilege and an honor to have you here. Thank you so much for coming. Um, there is no one better in this country to talk about Native American journalism than Mark. Um, I was um, reminding, refreshing my memory on his bio today, and I was tired just reading it. Um, he's worked at news organizations including the Arizona Republic, the Seattle Times, Salt Lake Tribune, Navajo Times, Navajo Nation Today, PBS Frontline. But then in addition to that, also has been a professor at the University of North Dakota and the University of Alaska Anchorage. Um, he's a former president of the Native American Journalists Association and also a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Um, so nobody better to lead us in a conversation about covering Indian country um, and the, the status of coverage of Indian country and also for students here um, moving forward what we should all be thinking about um, in covering this really important topic. So thank you, Mark, so much for being here. Um, so this time last year, um, Mark is, is currently editor of Indian Country Today. This time last year, Indian Country Today was dark. Um, Mark had not yet been, at least publicly, named the editor, right? right. So we're under a year since you took over. Um, and what an incredible journey you've had in the last year and the success that you've seen in such a short period of time is just remarkable. Um, and I'm hoping you can both take us back to where you were in thinking a year ago, um, where Indian Country Today had been, and then also how, what you've done to, to get to this point where you have nearly a million monthly viewers of your content. Right, a year ago it was uh, dark. Um, we actually had a meeting at the Native American Journal Association, and it was uh, pretty bleak. It was a conversation about What's the future going to look like? Where are people going to work? What kind of freelance opportunities are there going to be? And um, a couple of things happened. Um, one, we didn't know yet about Indian Country Today, and I didn't know any of that. But one of the good things that came out of that is a lot of the writers started finding outlets. And so suddenly, folks would be writing for High Country News. They'd be writing for The Atlantic. They'd be writing for a variety of publications and showing that there was another way to get the, the word out. Then um, the new owners of NCA of uh, Indian Country Today had this basically nothing except a name. And um, it's interesting because at the time, I thought it was a huge mistake to let it go dark. I thought, just keep something going, keep a facade, don't let it go dark. And now I realize I was completely wrong. Letting it go dark was one of the best things that happened because by the time I took over, I had no legacy issues. I could really decide how I wanted to do things uh, from scratch. And uh, although we did end up carrying over two staff, um, that became a huge advantage going forward. Um, one of the first things we decided is, well, and this is something that I thought from the beginning, is we now live in an era when the most powerful news platform that's ever been invented is in everybody's pocket. And um, you would think that you can build a business off of that, that people look at it all day, they think about it all day. And so I knew from the very beginning I wanted it to be completely focused on the mobile device to the exclusion of everything else. <laughs> um, and, and that's really, really where we started. I think I actually have a slide of uh, Indian Country. I'll talk about this one in a minute. Um, I'll, I'll, this is also a shout out to ASU. When we uh, first started, um, we knew we wanted to have a design that basically said mobile, and we wanted to um, um, take some of the elements of the old publication and weave them into a new design. And ASU's Sean Kwani is the one who came up with this design and did a great job. So. Um, that's what it looked like, the old one. You can see that there, he took just some of the elements of the new one. Um, one of the challenges for me as an editor is I'm completely colorblind. So I have to look at the numbers on the, the colors to know what they really are. <laughs> the old publication was um, 
around for 40 years. It had a very loyal audience, a lot of really great readers. It had um, spent, how should I say this? They weren't the wisest of people when they spent money. Uh, sometimes they would spend it on things that just didn't make any sense. And I was actually a benefactor of that. Um, so I had a blog called Trahant Reports, and um, one of the things, the conclusions I came to is that this digital world, world content wants to be free. And so I never charged anything for people to use my content in Trahant Reports. And uh, Indian Country Today called up and said, we really want to use your content more, and we want to pay you for it, but we want other people not to use it. And I said, I just can't do that. Uh, the whole point of what I'm trying to do is to make it completely free. And we went back and forth for about three months. They came up with plans like, uh, well, let us have it for two days, and then it can go out to everybody. And I was just, that's way too complicated. I don't want to do it. And so I walked away from what they were going to pay me. And then, probably about six months before the paper closed, they called me and said, we don't care. We're just going to start sending you a check. <laughs> And without any obligation or did, they started sending me $500 a month. <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of crazy, but that's an idea of how they were spending money. Um, their business model was pretty traditional, advertising, uh, big time advertising. They were based uh, mostly in New York. And um, I knew from the beginning that we had to be nonprofit and we had to look for a new model. And um, one of the really great things that happened really, oh, before we even started publishing. So just, uh, so I was hired March 1st, March 15th actually, and um, May 1st we launched a membership drive and we got $50,000 just off of social media. And people were sending in $25, $50, couple of people sent in $1,000. And that showed me that readers really cared about this product. They really wanted it back out. Uh, we started publishing in June, and the business model that I wanted to push was uh, kind of a three-legged stool of membership, which I think will eventually be about 10% of our revenue all times. Uh, advertising, and we actually have two advertising streams. We have uh, a traditional advertising department who sells ads and does all that. And where we're really strong is um, employment ads. If you want to hire somebody across Indian country, we're really the best source there is. And that's kind of been very important to us. But we also now have a program of uh, algorithm ad, uh, ads that are sold completely uh, by algorithm. And those are both digital ads and video ads. And the video ads are really interesting because um, they're $10 for every dollar spent on digital ads. So it's just really an interesting revenue stream for us. And then the third one is foundation support. And um, so I arrived in June to actually start the job and a foundation called me and said, you know, we don't have a lot of money, but we want to be the first. And so what would you do if we gave you $50,000? And I said, well, one thing I'd like to do is I'd like to have um, people come in from tribal newspapers, work for us for a little while, and then go back to tribal newspapers. And uh, they said, that's a great idea, we'll fund it. And so that's how we got our first fund, was for this uh, idea. We're actually starting our second uh, media fellow next week, uh, or next month, and uh, she's a reporter at the Navajo Times. She'll come to Washington, D.C., um, get a chance to cover some things there. Both the Navajo Times and us will use her material and then she'll go back to the Navajo Times. So that's kind of that process. And then not long after, we got a big grant. Uh, the Novo Foundation uh, gave us $250,000. So first six months before we really even got going, we had the next three years funded. And uh, that gives you enormous freedom to be able to think, all right, what do I want to do with this and how do we take it to the next level? And so then you began, you, you know, you had some money to, to get started, but you had to figure out who your audience was, what kind of coverage you're going to provide, what that was going to look like. Um, you knew you wanted to be mobile first or almost exclusively mobile. 
but there, there's a lot of latitude there. Sure. How did you make a determination about editorial priorities and then how you were gonna deliver this to an audience? Well, the first one was looking for a platform and um, I knew I wanted it to be really mobile focused to the point of uh, that's the only thing that mattered. And as I was shopping around, um, the old Indian country today had spent a lot of money on its website. Uh, they had a, a team do it. It, um, it exceeded $200,000 a year. And as I was researching, I came across this group that we eventually picked who, um, instead of charging you, sends you a check every month. <laughs> and it was completely mobile focused, which is what I wanted. They're new. What they do is they gather a lot of publishers together to try to get uh, a number, and then when they have 350 million unique users, they sell that to advertising. And so we're one partner of that. And that was what, exactly what we wanted, because we took something off the books that was very expensive, and now we earn a small uh, fee with that. We also have to share the advertising we sell with them, so there is a, still a cost, but it, it's a different kind of cost. Um, in terms of coverage, I knew um, we were gonna be based in Washington because that's where the owners were. And I think the first challenge was thinking, one, the challenge of getting people to move to Washington, which is really tough. <laughs> and second, um, I didn't want us to think of ourselves as a Washington institution. I wanted people to forget that we we're in Washington. And um, sure, we'll do stories, we'll do things up on Capitol Hill, but not to get, I don't want us sucked into the every day back and forth, but to think about the big picture stories. Um, some of this goes back to my thinking when I was a reporter. Um, they used to say I couldn't write a straight story in my life. And um, that definitely is the kind of things. I want features, I want things that are gonna hold up. I want things that people are gonna share. Um, we really want stories that find a way to um, reflect the complexity of life, not just the bad stories, not just the good stories, but really the wide breadth of the experience of Indian country. Um, and, and that's really a, a fascinating story now. And the other one that really I should mention because it defined us this year is the election. We had, um, for the first time, more Native candidates running for office than at any point in history. Um, I had been building spreadsheets for years and so I basically knew where everybody was and what they were doing. And um, that story allowed us to connect with readers in a very instant way. Um, and with, I mean, it was just really some great stories. Um, Paula Jordan in Idaho, um, Peggy Flanagan in Minnesota, and then Paul, uh, Deborah Holland and Sharice Davids in Kansas and New Mexico had this huge, people following everything they did, and we were really, when Deb announced, I was the only reporter there, and then you could see the progression as it became a bigger story and a bigger story and a bigger story, so that when she finally takes office in her New Mexico, in her office at Capitol Hill, the place is jammed with reporters, and it just was great irony knowing that it went from zero to that. Yeah, and actually, I think that leads to another point, which is the work that you do serves communities in Indian country, but also is a source for mainstream journalists across the country. Um, can you talk about how you see your role in, in both of those worlds? Sure, and this year, that was more true than any other year before. And it's partly because um, the way I view the digital world, I think information should not be proprietary that it should be shared as much as possible. So when anyone would want one of my spreadsheets, I'd send it to them. And um, this year, it was just amazing. Very early on, um, the New York Times and um, NPR started following my spreadsheets. Uh, although the Times is funny because the first story they did about candidates, they quoted me and they refused to quote me as a reporter. They wanted me only to be a professor. <laughs> and I'd already left University of North Dakota. I said, no, 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 I'm... <laughs> but they didn't want to have another news organization to get the credit. Mm. Uh, NPR, though, um, did. But then it just exploded. Um, suddenly, we're getting quoted in The Economist. We're getting quoted in 
Teen Vogue. <laughs> it just was a wide range of folks covering the election, and it all went back to that spreadsheet. And you and I have talked about Teen Vogue, um, not one that either one of us, I think, would have guessed. Um, but something that you pointed to as evidence of um, more interest and sort of other mainstream news outlets picking up these stories. Um, thinking broadly about coverage of Indian country um, in mainstream media, what is your sense of sort of the state of that coverage? Um, what are mainstream news organizations doing well? Where are we falling short? Um, and, and where do you see that moving forward? That's always a tough question for me because I always view, when someone says the media, I always want to know which one. <laughs> and some do really great jobs and others do less so. Who's doing a great job? Um, on occasion, the New York Times does excellent work. On occasion, the Washington Post does excellent work. Um, Seattle papers have done some great work. I've seen some great work at the Arizona Republic. Um, there are times when um, folks find the right story and connect with it. Cronkite does great work on occasion, and we use it a lot. Um, then there, I think, the papers that are more challenged, I think, well, actually there's data to back this up, so let me back up. There was a study done on the perception of American Indians in the media, and the number one finding was invisibility. And that's something that the media is part and parcel for. I think the biggest problem is probably television. And um, we're now just elected the first woman in the history of the United States, Native woman in the history of the United States to Congress, yet there's not a single Native American as a correspondent at any broadcast network. And that one position could change the conversation in big ways. And so I would see that invisibility being something that would be worth addressing at some point. And why do you think that is? Like, what would it take to try to really cultivate that and, and bring Native talent to television and, and lots of other um, platforms? Well, I think part of it is uh, ignorance and part of it is uh, looking at the numbers and think of Indian country is so small that it wouldn't contribute to numbers. Uh, I think that's a misreading because you really can't understand this history without understanding how Native Americans play into that. And that's just good journalism. Um, it's funny, so this gets ahead of the story a little bit, but um, five weeks before the election, we decided that this was an amazing year and it was gonna break records. And what could we do to capitalize on that? And I thought, well, what if we created a TV network for one night? And uh, it was five weeks out and we didn't, I mean, we didn't have a huge amount of money, but we had some money. And I called uh, a public television network, FNX, First Nations Experience, and Native Voice One, and said, would you like to do this? Both of them said yes. And in the next five weeks, in fact, Patty was one of our producers, <laughs> we hired uh, 40 people. We put together a network of correspondents across the country and um, covered the election for the first time ever from the perspective of these Native candidates. The next morning we did the breakdown meeting and I remember telling folks that if anyone ever says they can't find somebody, they need to watch all five hours of that television broadcast mm -hmm. because the talent we assembled was just extraordinary. Um, and we did things really, it was done on the cheap. Uh, for example, the reporters were using cell phones with microphones and doing the interviews that way on Skype. And we wanted to have two-way conversations, and you can't do that if you're using your cell phone for a Skype. So what we did is had cell phones in the back of everybody uh, in their shirts with a, a earpiece, and that was how they could communicate with the desk. It was very low rent, um, but on camera it looked great, and it worked. It was really phenomenal. But that's because we took a chance, we saw all this talent, that the networks just don't see. And I think that's a mistake on their part. I, I mean, one of the reasons I think we're partly successful is because there are not more Native Americans in mainstream media. And if those stories were out there in a broader sense, they wouldn't need us. But um, because they're not, I mean, people were waiting and hungry for our stories. 
Yeah, absolutely. And talk about the, the audience you have found. Okay. <laughs> I think I have data. Excellent. So we have had an amazing <laughs> run. <laughs> and um, you can see this was our January. We just about hit a million for the first time uh, in viewership. And uh, of course, that big spike is one story. Everyone probably knows what it is. <laughs> but nonetheless, we're um, approaching about, um, uh, in fact, this week, I'd say tomorrow or the next day, if you don't use a month-to-month -month comparison, but you use the last 30 days comparison, we will go over a million page views, a million unique users. And um, because our ads sell on algorithms, that's going to be good at the end of the month. <laughs> Uh, the other thing that's really extraordinary is um, this is our age demographic. And that second bar, our number one readership group is 25 to 34. And uh, nobody else in the media can say that. And I think that's partly our relentless focus on the cell phone, that this is our audience and this is what they're consuming. Our audience is also mostly female. Um, this, one's actually, this month was actually a little less than normal. Uh, it's about 60-40. Um, I think that's partly the story selection as much as anything. Uh, this is by device. And um, you can see how, uh, the, how powerful uh, the mobile phone has become. And I can't quite see it, but 76.6% is now from the mobile device. And only 17.6% is desktop and 5.8% tablet. Um, so that's really where people consume us. And, and that really fits across the line. So we look at how people go from, say, Facebook to um, our site. And even if they come from Facebook, they're coming from mobile Facebook, not from a desktop Facebook, which is really interesting to us. Um, you can see there's our 929,000 sessions uh, for the month, how close we came to that million. And then um, this is how people come to us. And um, what's interesting, um, probably unique to us, is our archives continue to produce uh, a lot of storytelling. And um, there's a story called um, The True Story of Pocahontas. And it's uh, been on our site for probably six years. It's on our top 10 list every single week. And um, we can actually tell from this data when school projects are due. <laughs> wow. Um, direct people who go to our site every day. And this is actually one we're working hard on. Um, we want people to go to the site every day and, by habit. And so one of the things we've been doing just in the last couple of weeks is we're now trying to edit by cycle. So we have a 7 AM cycle a 12 o'clock cycle and an afternoon cycle. And we're looking to see if we can get that traffic to match. And that second number is where that traffic would come from, is people who look for our, instead of looking for a story, will look for us and look to see what they have. And then social media is about 15%. Um, Most of that's Facebook, less so Twitter. Um, but both of them are pretty important and um, getting us to our readers. And then email. And referral. Email is really interesting because I mentioned uh, our young demographics. Um, there are a set of readers who don't want any of that, and they don't want to know anything new. And what they want is a newsletter. And um, we actually every week email a newsletter to them. The uh, demographic group is uh, considerably older, um, but they love it. And at some point, one of the things we're looking at now, and I don't know when we'll do it, but we've been looking at figuring out a way to do print on demand for that group, where they could actually get something in print, mailed to their house, and um, something they would have to deal with. Um, actually, the easiest way, and it may be what we'll do, is to um, print a book every month of the top stories. And it would be all print on demand, so we would have no cost. It would be all electronic. Um, I don't think. Oh, and this is just curiosity. This is what people come to us on, what devices. <laughs> um, so if you ever wondered how uh, big the iPhone is in Indian country, it's the iPhone. <laughs>
Um, I think that's the data. That's, um, that is remarkable data. I mean, for people who haven't spent a lot of time looking at target demographics, I mean, to have such a young, engaged audience um, is really powerful, um, speaks to the tremendous work that you're doing, um, but also how you've been able to connect with that audience. I mean, that doesn't happen just because you have great content. It, it happens because you've been able to engage them. Right. Um, what do you do on social media to try to generate that conversation? Well, one of my colleagues is on social media a lot, and she tries to engage people in different ways. I mean, it really is kind of the old, tell them what you're going to do, um, do it, and then tell them you've done it, and keep telling them. Um, probably our favorite referral site is Instagram. Um, and the nice thing about Instagram is people leave it and come back to us. Whereas with Facebook and Twitter, they tend to go through those two to read the content. Um, I think part of it is listening to people, uh, particularly young people. I have a good story about that. So when um, we started the membership drive, we surveyed the younger people we work with and around town and asked them, what should we give as a bonus for people who become members? And I was thinking coffee mug, because that's all that counts in the world. Um, and they said, you got to have socks. <laughs> 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 Socks was the right answer. Yeah. And it's not one we would have thought of on our own. That's excellent. Um, I want to transition a little bit, um, being a journalism school and having students here who um, may be writing Indian country stories or producing them for Cronkite News, um, maybe in reporting classes before actually getting there. Um, and. Um, and maybe looking for both guidance and how to approach stories, um, and then also where to look for stories themselves. Um, so maybe if we could start there, what are some stories that you feel like um, journalists have either missed or have really covered you know, in a, in a really poor fashion? Sure, well, and the one we've talked about this a lot, yeah. um, a really basic one is whenever there's a wide policy discussion, every story should include tribes. Great story last week on water policy and looked at the region and what different governments are doing, nothing about tribes. That's the kind of thing that's just gotta change because tribes are key players, they're figuring things out, and um, having that in just the everyday conversation I think is essential. That would be true of stories about veterans. That would be true of stories about um, homeless. You could go down the list. Just make sure there's some reference to the native people in the area. The second one on the big picture stories is looking for ones that um, connect to telling the story. I mean, you think about where we are in a state like Arizona that has so much of its image connected with the Indian experience and yet kids go through school and they don't know that it's city, county, state, and tribal. And it becomes the media's job then to educate rather than the schools. I think having that be out in front and be part of the conversation helps people think why it could change. Then you could look at how states that have changed it. In Montana, you can't go through school without having that at basic education. They call it Indian education for all. Uh, Oregon now has that, but that would be a natural in Arizona too. But that would be the connection between media and kind of the broader society. society. Um, I think um, one of the big stories that is going to be required much more sophistication is just how we cover climate change. And that's another one where tribal communities will definitely be a part of it. And looking for ways to broaden the story uh, so that there's context from the beginning. Um, and for, for students who may be um, trying to take on some of those stories, um, who haven't lived in Indian country, who don't already have sort of a source base there, what recommendations do you have for them in trying to make those, um, build those relationships and, and develop connections so that they can include those voices in their stories? Well, to me, the big one is learn to hang out. Um, when you go to a place and try to do a story on deadline, 
it's really tough because you're getting people to say, I need you to trust me right now without having any kind of groundwork. But if you can go early, talk to people, have a cup of coffee, not be on deadline, that's when you can start to build a rapport. Um, so that would be the first step. Um, understanding the history. I mean, things that happened yesterday have a connection that goes back a long time. And being able to articulate that to the sources, I think, is really uh, a great calling card. And what about, I mean, I, I feel like um, because journalists have often provided coverage that lacks nuance or doesn't provide the history, sometimes when you're reaching out, you're not only having to um, develop your own relationship, but there's reticence for people, from people who feel like they haven't been represented fairly in the past. Um, how would you recommend addressing that or, or working through that? That's a good question. I'm reminded eventually. When I worked at the Arizona Republic, um, it was when there was um, some civil unrest at Navajo. And uh, I was in the newsroom when I got a call, and I went right to the airport, and I got up there. And um, it was still unfolding, and both sides were still very hot and had weapons. And I remember the photographer saying, I don't want to be around you right now. And um, I remember thinking, this is the time to diffuse things. And I pulled out my notebook and just tried to walk in in a way that was very uh, calming. And um, it was the right approach. And both sides were really instantly willing to communicate. I've thought about that moment as a way to try to look for that moment, a way to diffuse it so you can get people to, to see why it's important to tell their story. Sometimes it's actually saying, here's why your story is so important. Uh, if you don't tell this, it's not going to get told. If you don't um, help us out, it's not about me getting a story as much as being able to get your voice out there. Um, <clears throat> what, are there, what are the other, in terms of having a voice, um, I'm curious, you know, because of social media and because of people having the ability to communicate so widely, um, in some ways, you know, everybody has a voice at this point and everyone can promote, you know, what they're trying to say. I'm wondering if that has changed the conversation if you see um, Native communities getting their own story out in such a way that they wouldn't need to go through a news outlet in order to do that. You know, you'd think that to be true, but the opposite is actually true. Um, opinions, I mean, it's funny, because we decided early on, I decided, and this killed me, because I used to be an editorial page editor, that we would not do opinions, that we would have only op-eds. And um, I was curious how those would go. And uh, we've been getting them pretty steady, and the surprising thing is the readership has been incredibly strong. Um, we had one piece that was 12,000 words, which is not a normal um, piece. And I can't remember the viewership on it, but it was well, it was really close to 100,000 reads. Um, so people value, I mean, I think the thing with social media is it's raw, it's not edited, it's not thought through the same way an opinion piece would be. So I think actually having a time to unfold an opinion is actually more valuable now, yeah. even in social media. That's interesting. You know, um, I wonder how you, you have a very small team in DC, um, and you are in DC, you know, on one side of the country. Um, how do you manage to cover, you know, Indian country, which is so huge and so diverse and so many different um, tribes and nations involved, how are you able to provide coverage that resonates with all of these different communities with such a small team in one location? Well, we do also have a lot of freelancers, and we look for people. Um, it's funny, the first time that really hit was when the Anchorage earthquake hit, and we were thinking, who do we have at Anchorage? And we're <laughs> calling around. And um, one of the writers who had done a couple of op-eds, actually a column, and uh, we called him up and said, you're not a columnist anymore. You're going to be a reporter like everyone else. And uh, he's, from then on, has just been doing news pieces. He liked it so much. Hmm. So it's finding people and then just getting them uh, time to do it. Um, 
I think over time, I mean, it's only seven months in, but I think over time that network of riders is only gonna grow uh, substantially. I mean, there are a lot more out there than we can use right now, but um, I, there are just so much talent out there. Um, what are you most excited about? I mean, you, you seem, you know, you're coming off of a tremendous year of growth. Um, you've been um, seeing remarkable progress, including in the political sphere. What are you most excited about looking out a year from now? It's another election year. <laughs> <laughs> I'm terrible, I love election years. <laughs> um, I don't know, I'm excited about the whole process. I keep thinking, my job is to raise money and be out front and edit and put presentation. And then I think, I gotta do that story and I get up early in the morning and start writing. So um, I'm not good at the discipline yet of uh, pulling away from it. Uh, this is just a very interesting time and there's so much to write about that um, I think if I had to put one thing on that, it would be fostering talent. Um, when I was young, Actually, I was at the Republic the first time I went to Alaska. There was a, a newspaper editor by the name of Howard Rock. And um, I remember at the time thinking the Alaska Native media experience was amazing. There was a couple of editor there was an editorial writer at the Anchorage Daily News. There was two reporters at the Anchorage Daily News. There was two people in television at the, in the Anchorage market. There was a, set, a lot of people in radio. And I kept thinking, why is Alaska so special? What, what's making Alaska kind of the place where native media is happening? And so I later decided to interview everybody. And I asked, how'd you get started? Oh, Howard Rock called me up. Howard Rock called me up and it said it over and over and over. And it dawned on me how much talent you can bring together having an institution like this. And that's what I would like to do more than anything else. Hmm. How do you see that? playing out, how do you see your role in that? Finding good people, letting them do good work, and um, learning from them. Oh. Speaking of great people doing great work, um, we'd love to start getting some questions from you. Um, so we'll bring a, a microphone up, um, <clears throat> if you could um, come forward and <clears throat> introduce yourself and, and bring your question here. Um, Tonal, jump at once. Um, go ahead, yeah. Come on up. Hi, my name's Adrian. Thanks for being here and doing the presentation. Very interesting. Um, basically, my question is, don't you think um, tribes and tribal organizations have to play a stronger role in doing their own media, like hiring public relations people and not only hiring them, but developing them. Because unless they spend time in the newsroom or their seasoned PR people, they don't really understand like how the media works. So like, how do we put more pressure on the tribes and the tribal organizations to invest in their own media and their own brands? Um. <clears throat> I guess I haven't thought too much about getting tribes to do that because to me every time they do that they're spending less on other things but what we've done to kind of build on that and something that tribes could um, take advantage of is when I first got there I noticed how many press releases were being thrown away and how this enormous pool of um, information that went nowhere. And I probably get 30 to 50 press releases a day. And so I decided what if we had a stream of nothing but press releases? And that's what we created. It's called the press pool. And all it is is press releases. We don't do really anything except post it. And it's amazing. The readership is never in the top story list, but it's solid. People read that um, and they're interested in it. So I think the message there for tribes is that there's an avenue that they can get stuff out. Um, it really runs the gamut. Some tribes spend enormous resources on PR. Um, we probably get 
10 press releases a day from various Navajo agencies, whether it be the council or the president's office. Um, other tribes have one or two. Um, it's a tough one for tribal media because um, a lot of tribal media resists the idea of being public relations and um, try to push for independence within the tribal structure. Um, it's always been interesting to me that this is a this is actually the oldest conversation in native journalism. The very first newspaper was the Cherokee Phoenix, and um, the Cherokee tribe wanted it to be the voice of the Cherokee official government, and the editor, Elias Boudinot, did not, and he felt that it should be the voice of all the citizens. And that contradiction between PR and, and news is something that tribes have had to deal with for a couple of centuries now. Uh, it's still not resolved. <laughs> I noticed that um, NAJA is creating a new program um, for investigative reporting, specifically around accountability for tribal government. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how that dynamic plays out today? And I was, I was struck by the language of their announcement, which talked about doing this reporting, you know, professionally at a high level and also um, with a concern for security of the journalists. Right. Um, can you talk about what, what kind of risks are involved in that and how that plays out? Well, first let me, let me get to a principle and then I'll get to the risk. Um, I think not just tribes, but rural governments in general and a lot of governments in general have not recognized that there's been a big shift. And that shift is that transparency is now a key value. And if you're gonna be successful communicating a message, transparency has to be a part of it. That the idea of withholding and keeping information protected just doesn't work. And um, so that transformation has to happen. Um, in terms of security, um, I don't know. I, I've never really felt insecure reporting in tribal communities, so I'm not sure where that came from. Um, I know some of the tribes in Oklahoma just recently have gone through a lot, but it's been more job security than um, physical security. And how common is it in Indian country for there to be truly independent journalism about tribal government with, you know, within the tribal community? Depends on the editor. Um, a lot of editors are very stubborn and determined to do the right thing. And it's interesting that this is a uniquely American discussion because the rest of the world has independent state media um, in various degrees. It's just here that the idea that it has to be private sector. Hmm. Um, I mean, BBC will do things the British government doesn't like a lot. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's kind of a conversation that just has to happen. Probably Richard LaCourse, uh, the late Richard LaCourse has written about this more than anybody. And he argued that basically it was um, an editor who determined that they represented all of the citizens rather than those who just happened to be elected. Hmm. Um, can you talk about the Indian Child Welfare Act? You mentioned this <clears throat> as we were talking last week about um, as an example of something that really needs more nuanced coverage and, and understanding. Um, it certainly is something that students at the Cronkite School have covered and I'm sure will continue to cover. Um, what is it that you know, journalists are, are getting wrong or not understanding fully in those right. stories? Well, I mean, the, the main narrative of the Indian Child Welfare Act has been about one family protecting a child from a tribe trying to take them away. And that misses the story that's been unfolding for a couple hundred years, but especially since 1979. Prior to 1979, it was very common for Indian babies to get taken out of the home and uh, transferred to a, a non-Indian family, and that was the end of it. And um, a lot of those kids, when they grew up and became adults, uh, went through years of saying that wasn't the right approach, and finally Congress listened. 1979, they passed the Indian Child Welfare Act, and, and all that act did was require a process. It's not like it said a non-Indian family can never adopt a, an Indian child. It just said there had to be a process in place, 
and that process often used the tribal courts. And there have been a number of groups that have tried to undermine that. The great irony here in Arizona is that it's the Goldwater Institute that's led the charge against that. And Barry Goldwater was not that way. <laughs> um, Barry Goldwater, I, I mean, when Richard Nixon decided to return Taos Pueblo, um, Blue Lake to the Taos Pueblo, Barry Goldwater testified for two hours in the Senate without notes about the power of Pueblo religion. And so the idea of them using the Goldwater Institute as a vehicle to undermine these child welfare cases is really extraordinary because um, uh, that was not Barry Goldwater. Uh, in fact, I've been actually, I want to try to reach Barry Goldwater Jr. and see if he remembers any of this and be able to try to um, get to that story that way. I think it's still a great story. Um, that's a good example, though, of context, that if you look at it just right now and see that one family, you think that's the story. But if you look at the whole broad picture, it's a very different point of view. One of the weird quirks in that law is, do you know where most non-Indian babies that are still adopted out in the United States come from? Canada. They still import kids. Hmm. And even now, that continues. Um, so it remains a real issue hmm. in terms of protecting a tribal community. What are, what are some other big issues that you feel like um, you know, we're, we're missing some context for um, and how we're covering ongoing issues? Well, gambling. Um, in gambling, you have two contradictory worldviews. On one hand, you have a Judeo-Christian view, and gambling is often another, something to stay away from, something you need to protect people from. Uh, in most tribal cultures, Coyote tells gambling stories. It's part of the deal. It's very much a part of life. And uh, those two worldviews really collide. Um, my tribe, Shoshone Bannock, they have gambling instruments they found that are 11,000 years old. Wow. So it's been part of our culture forever. And the only difference, in fact, one of the other stories the media gets wrong is when they write about states wanting to regulate, regulate and profit from Indian gaming, they look at it in that context. I look at it in the context of the fight between two bookies because the state is just as involved with gambling <laughs> as the tribe. It's just in a different area. Huh. Other questions that you all have, please feel free to, to come forward. Harrison. <laughs> uh, I'm a grad student. Oh, now it's working. Uh, I'm a grad student here at the Cronkite School. Um, I just wanted to ask, what do you think is the biggest mistake you see non-native reporters making when they're covering Indian country, and how can they stop doing that? <laughs> yeah. The biggest mistake, I'll have to use a very scientific word. I don't know what it is, if there's a missing gene or what, but so many reporters, when they write about Indians, have to get hokey. <laughs> And it drives me nuts. Um, suddenly they see feathers everywhere and stuff. And um, I think it's important to put tribal people in the 21st century and to think about how it is today and not just having a context that's from the past. Um, I think the biggest mistake remains invisibility, though, and not writing about it enough and not putting it in the day-to-day -day context of the same stories that everybody's dealing with. Um, it's funny because we were talking about what you would tell young people about getting expertise. And to me, one area of expertise that I would encourage every young person to know from going forward is water policy and water law. If you know those two things, you'll never have to work again. And every one of those stories involve tribes. Uh, hi, my name is Ron. I'm a master's student here for Digital Audience. I was very intrigued by your data that you had and how far you were able to drill down. My question is, is because there's connectivity issues on the reservations and there's policy being written about that right now, a lot of tribes use the public library in the local town to connect. And I saw that your data showed that your lab or laptop or desktop usage was down. Do you think that's down because you haven't researched it enough or you're finding that they really are using mobile and that connectivity is actually getting better to where they can access? Th thanks, that's a great question. So when we first started, 
we started testing um, our connectivity in different areas. And um, we wanted to have um, the mobile platform load really fast off the cellular network so they wouldn't need internet. And um, of all places, I took two phones and tested it in Bethel, Alaska, and figured if it worked in Bethel, it will work anywhere. <laughs> and um, it was so fast that I knew we weren't going to have a problem with it. Um, the platform we have works really great off a cell phone line. It, the one area that does work better, and this actually shows up in our data, is when people watch videos, they tend to wait till they get to a Wi-Fi connection, uh, partly because you don't want to use up all your data. Um, but for the site itself, it works fine just with cell phone. And in some pretty remote spots. I've tried it in several spots now. We've talked about the role of media, um, to a certain extent, the, the role of tribes. I want to ask you about the ro role of journalism schools, um, because that's another factor in both a pipeline of talent um, and also in training of journalists. Right. Um, what should journalism schools be doing now that they're not doing, as far as you've seen? Well, and I want to broaden this beyond Cronkite, because I think you do a lot of things well. To me, the biggest thing that every, well, there are two things that every young person should know about a career in journalism is one, everything you know is going to change every couple of years. And so just deal with it. And not only deal with it, but get excited by it because it's fun. And the second point is learn to be an entrepreneur. And not just an entrepreneur in terms of how you deal with the outside world, but once you're in an organization, you need to be an entrepreneur and figure out how to move around in, in a very shifting environment. Uh, the media is I'm so different now than when I started. And this kind of goes to a goofy story. but So I was running the Showband News in Fort Hall, Idaho when I was at Weekly. And I was still a teenager. And uh, I've always been an early adopter. And I saw these telex machines. I thought, this would be a great way to share information way before the internet. And they were 100 bucks, and so I bought a couple. And we started experimenting. And um, I couldn't get anybody else to do it. And so we ended up with these two machines that couldn't talk to anybody. <laughs> but that sort of change, if we had thought then, wow, in 15 years, everybody's going to be talking to everybody all the time, we would have stuck with it and got more people on and, and started doing it. Um, so that. I think the ability to, to adapt is probably the most important lesson out of a journalism school, that whatever institution you work for is going to be very different, maybe even a year. Um, I think one of the most disappointing parts of my career is when I worked for the Seattle PI, we had a major reinvention project. And we spent a year talking about what a newspaper could do, how to rethink everything how to um, just survive in the next century. And after we got done, uh, the corporate folks said, that's too radical. We don't want to do it. <laughs> and we ended up doing none of that. And I just think, how many newspapers, if they really set out and tried to think about what it's going to look like, and even to the point of changing things that work, because there might be something better that we haven't thought of. Um, I think that sort of spirit needs to be in journalism schools. Uh, every part of the media has changed dramatically. The first time I did a front line, we had a crew of five. We could only work so many hours a day. Um, if we went over that, it was triple time. It was very prescribed. The next time I did a front line, they said, here's X number of dollars. Go do the story and come back. <laughs> That, that's a pretty dramatic change. Hmm. What is, you know, you, you talked about the value of, of taking over an organization that had gone dark, so you didn't have the legacy part to deal with, um, at least except for the, the people you chose to carry right. over. Um, what, what is your guidance for young journalists who go into legacy media organizations who don't have the you know, in, in some ways, like sort of the, the latitude to start from scratch. 
um, but want to work within within a legacy news organization and make change and enjoy getting to play with new technology and, and play with new ways of doing things. I guess that to me it would be to make sure that they're taking the message of how <clears throat> news can be shared with millennials and making sure that people listen to them about that. The millennials are now the largest generation, potentially the largest consumers of news, and this is an opportunity to, to have a different kind of discourse, and it's something we should be embracing. Mark, uh, you've had more jobs than anyone I've known. <laughs> I can't hold years. a job. <laughs> um, but I mean, I think it's something instructive that you could share with people here. You've, you've worked with large newspapers, both on the news side and the editorial side. You've worked with tribal media, both established papers and the startups. Uh, you've been in and out of uh, academia. Uh, you took a long sabbatical in Lake Como. Um, what, what have you taken out of all those experiences and how does that inform what you do today? You know, the weird thing is that um, every job I've had, at the time, it was the most fun job in the world and I never could see leaving it. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess it would be passion. Um, I just remember thinking in Seattle when I was at the editorial page, they're paying me to do this. <laughs> What's wrong with them? I had one day where we had an editorial board meeting with Bono, another day on health policy, and I liked him equally as well. <laughs> <laughs> and I think there are so many ways to earn a living. I don't think you do journalism to earn a living. I think you do journalism because it's fun. And every day, going to work with, I mean, I, I just hired a young person, and I remember her first words, every day I get to get up and do Indian stories. And that's exactly what she brings to it every day. And that's what it should be like. I mean, we should be there because we want to do these great stories. And what platform that takes place, whether it's academia or Lake Como or um, uh, a traditional newsroom, it doesn't matter, it's the stories. What's been your real favorite? Real st favorite story? Favorite job that you've had. Oh, right We're now, all the favorite at the blast. time, but yeah, you seem to be. <laughs> I'm having a blast right now. Yeah. What's your favorite part of your job? Well, the surprise when readers really connect with a story you don't expect to, to get that reaction from. So um, election, or election, I'd written about everything I could possibly think of, and Cherise Davids and Deb Holland are coming to Washington, and I thought, what am I going to do now? I've written everything there is to write about them. And um, so the night before they came, I thought, I'm going to write about everybody who lost and never made it to office. Huh. And um, I did that, and it was a piece about the legacy of women running for office. It had 66,000 shares on Facebook. Wow. <laughs> it blew me away how many people were sharing that piece, mm. and um, that was really nice. Mm. Well, thank you so much, Mark, for, for coming, for sharing your experience with us, and sharing your experience with us the entire day and, and talking to classes. Incredibly grateful for all of your work and hope to continue being a partner with you Thank moving you. forward. Thank you so much. Thank you.